response to that problem. We don't have the original question, we just have the answer. But the answers are good enough, I think. We don't need to worry about that, except for the book of Romans. Romans wasn't written to answer the question. Romans was written specifically, it says it in the text, to explain what it means to be a Christian. And so there's no doubt in my mind that um, that's the reason why people quote Romans most at evangelical crusades and such. Because it tells you what it means to ask Christ in your heart. But the story of why Romans was written is found in Acts 23, chapter 10 through 11, which is history. Paul was just in conflict, but once again he was almost stoned to death. And it says that the conflict grew more violent. The commander was afraid that they would tear Paul apart. So he ordered his soldiers to go and rescue him by force and take him back to the fortress. And that night the Lord appeared to Paul and said, Be encouraged, Paul. Just as you've been a witness to me in Jerusalem, you must preach the good news in Rome as well. If ever you feel like you've had a misunderstanding with God, that you thought God promised you one thing and you got another, Look at the scriptures, because it happens all the time in the Bible. It happens all the time. Paul, Paul's home was in Tarsus in Rome. He loved Rome. And in almost every book, he says, I must go see Rome. And that encouraged him when the Lord said, you're going to be a witness in Rome. And I would bet my year's wages that Paul thought he was going to travel to Rome. I bet he wanted to pack his bags. But that's not what happened. You know that in history. Instead, Paul would write this beautiful letter in preparation to travel to Rome, talking about what Christianity is. And upon, after the letter was sent, the Roman soldiers would take him out. Within five miles of the city, he would look up and see the city, and they would decapitate him. He never got to see Rome, but he was a witness in Rome. And I know there's people in Oklahoma right now that are wondering why the storm brought them. Not a lot of them have been on the news. There's been a lot of Christians on the news saying, God saved us. But there were a few people who died. And they're learning that hard lesson. Sometimes God doesn't stop the storm. Sometimes God gives you peace in the midst of the storm. But that peace comes from leaning on Jesus as Lord. And so let's hear what Paul has to say to the Romans about what it means to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. For Moses writes that the law's way of making a person right with God requires obedience to law's command. But faith's way of being right with God says, don't say in your heart, who will go up to heaven? That is to bring Christ down. And who will go up to earth? Who goes to the place of the dead? That is to bring Christ back again. In fact, the message is very close at hand. It is on your lips and in your heart. The message is about the faith we preach. Um, I know that's a difficult passage to understand. Eugene Peterson writes, uh, don't try to figure out, and I think this is close to the Greek, don't try to figure out how I can bring Jesus down to the problem. And don't try to figure out how I can raise Jesus again from the dead. I can't do that. Don't try to be God in this situation. And I think that is closer to the Greek. And I try to translate it myself, but when I just read Eugene Peterson, he's a Presbyterian minister in the translation, but that's a good interpretation. Don't try to go get Jesus to come down. Don't try to raise him up from the dead. That's already been done. He came down. He's with you. The message is in your very heart. Remember uh, Dorothy the Wizard of Oz? Now, the book is not like the movie, but in the movie at the end, the, the good witch says to her, and I do her accent if I could do it because it's so funny. It's always been with you, dear. The answer has always been in your heart. She could always find home if she looked for it. The Lordship of Christ is always with you. That's the passage that Eugene just beautifully read from Deuteronomy. Before God gives the Ten Commandments, He says the answer is within you. There's something about the salvation of God that resounds in you. It resounds in you. And the, the resonation of that 
is that our confession of faith in Jesus Christ. That if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and if you believe in your heart, you will be saved. It is nothing more than a confession of faith. <coughs> and as I said to the kids, and I'll just repeat it now, um, the only one called Curious in Rome, which is the Greek word for the Lord, is Caesar. You said that to anyone else, especially an insurrection that you paid for it with your life. In the Hebrew temple, the Septuagint, which is the Greek version of the Old Testament, the only one who was called Lord was Yahweh, was God. You said Jesus was Lord in the temple, you lost, you, you were put out of the temple, and you lost your relationship with your family. If you confess with your heart that Jesus is Lord, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Jesus is King, first of all, and Jesus is God, <coughs> second of all. The resurrection of the dead it's necessary to believe that Jesus is your Savior. I believe Jesus rises within us when we worship, but there's a whole school of thought right now that going to stress a song called the Jesus Seminar. People say they're gaining popularity, but since they've been around, I had an opportunity to have a discussion with this man, um, John Dominic Crossland. But his argument was, and his argument wasn't hard to take apart, but his argument essentially was is that what does it matter if you raised from the dead? Doesn't it just matter if they killed you? And it's kind of an argument that suddenly says it doesn't matter if he was God. And it puts him with all the other teaching. It does matter that he's God. I, I get what he's trying to say. He says sometimes Christians get too much into this, I love God, God loves me, that they don't care about the world around them. But I argued with him then, and I was able to successfully argue with him, that the greatest works of Christian charity hadn't come from intellectuals at Harvard Seminary discussing whether Jesus rose from the dead. The greatest works of Christianity, people like Mother Teresa, people like Florence Nightingale, people who went out and changed their world, came because people had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. No one did more for special education than Fanny Crosby. We sing her hymns every morning. And she is the most avid person who talks about the sweetness and love of Jesus. She's someone Donna Crosby would not like. Because she talks about me and Jesus. It's out of this love for a living Lord that great works are wrought. Not out of a dead intellectual theology where we discuss who is my neighbor and what does it mean to love my neighbor as myself. It comes out of spirit-filled questions. It was out of the Quaker prayer meetings that abolitionism was born. It was out of the Methodist prayer meeting that the suffragette movement started. And also, fights against child labor started. And you just heard a story this morning that it was out of Martin Luther King Jr.'s evangelical preaching. I have a book of his sermons in my office if you want to see it. He was evangelical. That the civil rights movement was started. So spare me the talk that somehow evangelicals aren't looking out for the world. I know we make mistakes. Any group of people will. But it is out of our love for Jesus Christ in the midst of the storm that causes us to do great things. And I want to share two stories from the hurricane of two people who out of their love they did great things. The first one is Susan Haley. She was uh, the teacher who laid herself over her students' bodies to protect them. She said, I could hear the storm approaching and it sounded like a jet coming closer and closer, Haley said. The storm intensified, and she smiled with the children, trying to sing and play it down. And then, when she could do nothing else, she prayed. In the name of Jesus, she prayed, and the children joined her. They prayed and sang Amazing Grace. And at some point, the lady of the desk was impelled in Haley's cap. And amid the chaos, Haley said she could feel the pressure on her leg, and she asked one of her daughters whether something was stuck in it. And she screamed that it was in my leg, Haley said. 
But amazingly, by the grace of God, I calmed her down. I felt Christ's hand on me at that very moment. Haley says, would she have done anything differently? But she said she wouldn't. It is by the presence of Jesus that I didn't lose it, she said. I wouldn't change anything about it. I knew I had to be there to calm the kids' sake and Christ calm me. An intellectual Jesus that talked about loving others as yourself, that taught esoteric teachings, may not have helped her at that moment. And she doesn't talk about, well, I remember the golden rule, so I put myself in my kids' bodies. She doesn't say that, notice that? <laughs> she doesn't say, well, I knew that they were smaller than me, so I had to protect them because that was my moral obligation. Although she says that some, she says, because Christ called me, I could call others. And then the Apostle Paul says, For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and you are saved. The word cardia was the word for heart and mind. It was soul. And so it's with your inner being that you say, I want this Jesus to be my Lord. But it doesn't mean anything until you say it aloud. Jesus says, confess Confess me before others, and I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. Because it's that confession that gives you great power. And then he says, as the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. For there's no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all of them. Richly blesses all who call on him. Anyone who calls on the Lord will be saved. And the word saved means not only to be rescued, we know that is so so. But it also means to be made whole. And in Jesus Christ, not only are we rescued, we're made whole in Him. We're made complete in Him. The word shame, that was the passage that, uh, that, that Eugene read from Isaiah. And in that passage, the, Isaiah is talking to the truth that are going to war. And he says that none of you will be put to shame those who trust in God. So it's talking about life and death situations. And it is, and I can testify to it, because I've been at so many deathbeds. It is in those final moments that people lay aside most of their doubts. The most intellectual, cynical Christian or person has called me to the bedside and told me about a childhood conversion. Sometimes I'm in the hospital and I'm singing to someone, and the nurse will say, there's son, I'd like to talk to a minister, would you go? And I go in there and they'll say, this is what I believe and I remember, is it still true? And I say, yes it is. And we still pray together. Not only was that teacher showing the courage of confessing Jesus Christ, there was another woman, I think, that showed a tremendous amount of courage, and her name was Shiloh Terry. Taylor. Shiloh Taylor gave birth to him in that storm. And she was in the middle of labor on the upper floor of the Monroe Medical Center delivering her second child when the monster storm directly hit the tiny local hospital, ripping away at the roof and walls. Taylor's family, including her husband, were sent downstairs to the cafeteria moments before the twister hit. Being too far along, the 25-year-old was forced to break out the peak of the storm of childbirth in the midst of the terrifying storm. And on Wednesday, Taylor, re Taylor relived how she huddled with four selfless nurses who put their lives at risk to help her deliver baby as the floor shook like an earthquake beneath them and the ceiling tiles fell. We were just sitting there holding hands and praying, calling on the name of the Lord, Taylor said, as she remembered, as she described hearing the eerie silence of the storm center, before she dared to open her eyes. But three, day, three hours later, she delivered Brandon Emmanuel, a healthy eight pound, three ounce baby. His middle name is Emmanuel, which means God is with us. Taylor told NBC News. The name was picked out four months earlier, and now I know why. I felt the presence of Jesus with me. Not the teachings of Jesus. Not the intellectual person of Jesus. The living Christ.
Christ. So one of the things Don Crossman asks is he says, do you think that your faith, the faith that you practice, the Christianity, he kept on Miss Kincaid. So I wasn't a reverend yet and felt very condescending. But he said, Miss Kincaid, do you think the Christianity that you practice will be around in the because he thought in 25 years he would be dead. And I told him that the German theologians were predicting that in 1901, when he stammered back, I said, it's still alive. And then I said, yes, as long as Jesus Christ meets someone in the crisis of their life, as long as he reaches down with his nail scarred hands through time and space and touches someone with that saving knowledge, Christianity, it may look different, but it will live. Because Christianity was never just a religion. It was a relationship with Jesus Christ. And when we confess it with our mouth, we own it. So I just have one sermon point today. There's a little scripture here. If you can't see, it says, follow him. The disciples left everything and followed him. Continue to confess your faith by owning your faith. And that means saying, if you go, if you hear one day, I know it may sound ridiculous, it may seem outdated, but you know what? It saved me. And it continues to save me. So the song we're going to sing today uh, on Christ Alone is a confession of faith. And I love it because it's a confession of faith, just like the Apostles' Creed. It goes through who we believe in as Jesus and why we believe.